I'm going to be starting in verse 19. Here's, I'm going to do something real quick that we never do at this church. I never hear anybody do it anyway. I'm going to do it off of my phone today. Here's how I do this so that you know. I go to Google. If you don't know what Google is, just use a Bible. I'm not going to take the time to explain it to you. Go to Google. Put in Genesis 25, leave a space, and then put NLT because I'm going to be reading out of the New Living Translation today. All right? So if you're picking up a paperback Bible and the words are a little bit different, that's why. If you've got a phone, Google Genesis 25, NLT. What I do is I make eye contact with people who are staring at me like this, and then they slowly pull out their phones. It's funny. To lay a little bit of groundwork, right, we're going to talk about Jacob and Esau today. Are you familiar with Jacob and Esau? Okay, good, good. Now, if you didn't know, let's rewind a little bit back into history. We had a guy named Abraham. Do you remember Abraham? All right, if you don't remember Abraham, Father Abraham had many sons, and Isaac was one of them. So Isaac, (laughs) all right, was one of the sons of Abraham. And if you remember, Abraham was going to sacrifice Isaac because he was being faithful to God. He never did. I'm looking at him right now. He was going to sacrifice him, but he never did. Okay, you with me so far? I'm just trying to, like, make sure we, you know what I'm talking about, right? So what we're going to talk about today, starting in verse 19, Genesis 25. Let me get to it real quick. Okay, we're talking about the births, the births of Esau and Jacob. You ready? All right, here it comes. This is the account of the family of Isaac, the son of Abraham. When Isaac was 40 years old, he married Rebekah the daughters of Bethuel the Armenian from Paddan Aram and the sister of Laban the Armenian. Isaac pleaded with the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was unable to have children. The Lord answered Isaac's prayer and Rebekah became pregnant with twins. But the two children struggled with each other in her womb. So she went, so she went to ask the Lord about it. Why is this happening to me? She asked. And the Lord told her, the sons in your womb will become two nations from the very beginning. The nations will be rivals. One nation will be stronger than the other, and your older son will serve your younger son. And when the time came to give birth, Rebecca discovered that she did indeed have twins. The first one was very red at birth and covered with thick hair like a fur coat. So they named him Esau. Then the other twin was born with the hand grasping Esau's heel, so they named him Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when the twins were born. Now, when I read that the first time, okay, and I looked at it and said, so the kid was born red and hairy, so they named him Esau. I'm like, okay, why? So I I looked it up. What does Esau mean? Esau means hairy. (laughs) Got my answer, all right? Means Harry. Now, I've never seen anybody been like, yeah, I seen a deer the other day. It was very Esau. I never saw that. Never heard that. <laughs> but I'm just letting you know that that word Esau does indeed mean Harry. Now, Jacob, I looked up that definition, and this is what it means. To follow or be behind. But it can also mean overreach. Now, I started getting more intrigued, right? So if you pay attention to what's said in the scripture, it said that Esau was bur- born first, first, Harry, okay, Harry boy, first. Second one was holding on to the heel. He was following. He was behind. But as Rebecca was told by the Lord, he is going to overreach the first. Are you with me so far? Okay. Now, th- remember, back in those times, the birthright was very, very important. The firstborn got all the good stuff. Who cares about the secondborn, right? So in Isaac's mind, Esau was the man. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more. So let's go to verse 27, all right? Mine titles this, Esau Sells His Birthright. Are you with me? Okay. As the boys grew up, Esau became a skillful hunter. Oh, yeah. He was an outdoorsman, but Jacob had a quiet temperament, preferring to stay at home. Isaac loved Esau because he enjoyed eating the wild game Esau brought home, but Rebekah loved Jacob. One day, when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau arrived home from the wilderness, exhausted and hungry. Esau said to Jacob, I'm starved. Give me some of that red stew. This is how Esau got his other name, Edom, which means red. Not not very deep with this one, all right? Harry, red man. Okay. All right, Jacob replied, but trade me your rights as the firstborn son. Look, I'm dying of starvation, said Esau. What good is my birthright to me now? 
But Jacob said, first, you must swear that your birthright is mine. So Esau swore an oath, thereby selling all his rights as the firstborn to his brother Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and lentil stew. Esau ate the meat, then got up and left. He showed contempt for his rights as the firstborn. We following along? We're good? All right. So I looked up the word contempt, right? Contempt because Esau felt contempt for his birthright. The feeling that a person or a thing is beneath consideration, worth less of deserving. It also can mean disregard for something that should be taken into account. So, to make it clear, Esau really didn't think much of his birthright. Cool? Following along? All right. So, I started going, that's pretty interesting because Abraham and God were tight. You remember, Abraham at one point was like bargaining with God. And was like, God, but if there's, you know, don't destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. What if there's 50 good people? And God was like, okay, if there's 50 good people, I won't do it. And Abraham was like, what about 45? And they got all the way down to 10, right? So this is the kind of relation, relationship that Abraham and God had. Isaac, right? Isaac was very faithful to God, followed all of his commandments, and was a really upstanding good man. But we get to the third son, and he's a so far, right? Sorry, but, you know, so I looked up some information. And it was kind of funny how sometimes when you're studying to teach somebody something, God will send you down some really crazy paths. So what I started looking up was, and this is weird, I looked up family businesses that failed on the third generation, right? And I found some interesting stuff. Here we go. When the company's handed over from the person who originated the company to the second person, it's 88% successful, meaning that that second person takes over, and 88% of the time, it continues to work. But when the second hands it over to the third, 12%. And when the third hands it over to the fourth, Four percent. I'm going to show you some real ones that really happened. Maybe you'll know them. You ever heard of Steinberg Grocery in Canada? Yeah, you ever heard of Steinberg? Cool. So check this out. Steinberg was created in 1917 by an immigrant that I can't pronounce their name. So it's just an immigrant. Uh, they had a dream. <laughs> by the 50s and the 60s, the company was extremely successful. So the second generation took over and created the idea of the supermarket in 1934. Right? So like when you walk into Walmart now and there's stuff everywhere, that, all, that whole idea came from this company called Steinberg. Right? But after the second, the son, gave it to his three daughters when he was passing away, the three daughters fought for control over this company. And by 1992, they were bought out, done. Right? Third generation, they blew it. I'm going to hit you with one that's even more popular. Some of you might have their bags. Gucci. Oh, Gucci. She's like, oh, I got one. <laughs> Gucci, right? Uh, once again, I looked at these names and I couldn't pronounce them. So we got Gucci 1, Gucci 2, Gucci 3. Here we go. They were founded in the early 1900s as a luggage company, just suitcases, okay? In 19, let me see, 19, oh boy, 1903, oh boy, 1953, my pen, my quen, my pen quit working. At some point, it was handed over to the eldest son and he made it into a premier fashion brand. So at some point, you, you remember, you've seen it, the runways, Gucci, Gucci bag, all that stuff, right? And then it was handed over to the two sons, oh, and they blew it. Uh, by 1991, the company was $17.3 million in debt. And the two sons, separate of that debt, had accumulated $40 million worth of debt. They blew it. They blew it hardcore. Now, if you look, you'll still find Gucci things that are available to purchase. Just so you know, the company's been phased out. It really doesn't exist anymore, but Gucci's still around in name only because if they stick it on the bag, you go crazy and spend $500. <laughs> Sorry. I'm not trying to break hearts. Just letting you know. <laughs> so I just want to recap with you. Remember, Abraham was highly regarded, right? Him and God had a great relationship. He was blessed, right? Isaac took over the reins. He was blessed. Now we've made it to Esau and Jacob. Rebecca knows that Jacob's going to have that birthright. Esau's supposed to have it. He's unaware of it now. We with me so far? Okay. We're now going to go to, um, let me see here real quick, Genesis 27. We're not skipping over things about these two. We're just skipping over some stuff that's not relevant to the story. So Genesis 27. I'd like to give you some time. We good? All right. Here we go. So one day, when Isaac was old and turning blind, he called for Esau, his older son, and said, 
my son. Yes, father, Esau replied. I am an old man now, Isaac said, and I don't know when I may die. Take your bow and a quiver full of arrows and go out into the open country to hunt some wild game for me. Prepare my favorite dish and bring it here for me to eat. Then I will pronounce the blessing that belongs to you, my firstborn son, before I die. But Rebekah overheard what Isaac had said to his sons, or to his son Esau. So when Esau left to hunt for the wild game, she said to her son Jacob, Listen, I overheard your father say to Esau, Bring me some wild game and prepare, prepare me a delicious meal. Then I will bless you in the Lord's presence before I die. Now my son, listen to me. Do exactly as I tell you. Go out to the flocks and bring me two fine young goats. I'll use them to prepare your father's favorite dish. Then take the food to your father so he can eat it and bless you before he dies. But look, Jacob replied to Rebekah, my brother Esau is a hairy man and my skin is smooth. What if my father touches me? He'll see that I'm trying to trick him and then he'll curse me instead of blessing me. But his mother replied, then let the curse fall on me, my son. Just do what I tell you. Go out and get the goats for me. So Jacob went out and got the young goats for his mother. Rebekah took them and prepared a delicious meal, just the way Isaac liked it. Then she took Esau's favorite clothes, which were there in the house, and gave them to her younger son Jacob. She covered his arms and the smooth parts of his neck with the skin of the young goats. Then she gave Jacob the delicious meal, including the freshly baked bread. So Jacob took the food to his father. My father, he said. Yes, my son, Isaac answered. Who are you, Esau or Jacob? Jacob replied, it's Esau, your firstborn son. I've done as you told me. Here is the wild game. Now sit up and eat it so you can give me your blessing. <laughs> Isaac asked, how did you find it so quickly, my son? The Lord, your God, put it in my path, Jacob replied. Then Isaac said to Jacob, come closer so I can touch you and make sure that you really are Esau. So Jacob went closer to his father, and Isaac touched him. The voice is Jacob's, but the hands are Esau's, Isaac said. But he did not recognize Jacob because Jacob's hands felt hairy, just like Esau's. So Isaac prepared to bless Jacob. But are you really my son Esau, he asked. Yes, I am, Jacob replied. Then Isaac said, now my son, bring me the wild game. Let me eat it, and then I will give you my blessing. So Jacob took the food to his father, and Isaac ate it. He also drank the wine that Jacob served him. Then Isaac said to Jacob, please come a little closer and kiss me, my son. So Jacob went over and kissed him, and when Isaac caught the smell of his clothes, he was finally convinced, and he blessed his son. He said, ah, the smell of my son is like the smell of the outdoors, which the Lord has blessed. From the dew of heaven and the richness of the earth, may God always give you abundant harvests of grain and bountiful new wine. May many nations become your servants, and may they bow down to you. May you be the master over your brothers, and may your mother's sons bow down to you. And who curse you will be cursed, and all who bless you will be blessed. As soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob, and almost before Jacob had left the father, Esau returned from his hunt. Esau prepared a delicious meal and brought it to his father. Then he said, sit up, my father, and eat my wild game, so you can give me your blessing. But Isaac asked him, who are you? Esau replied, it's your son, your firstborn son, Esau. Isaac began to tremble uncontrollably and said, then who just served me wild game? I've already eaten it and blessed him just before you came. And yes, that blessing must stand. When Esau heard his father's words, he let out a loud and bitter cry. Oh, my father, what about me? Bless me too, he begged. But Isaac said, your brother was here and he tricked me and he has taken away your blessing. Esau exclaimed, no wonder his name is Jacob, for now he has cheated me twice. First, he took my rights as the firstborn, and now he has stolen my blessing. Oh, haven't you saved even one blessing for me? Isaac said to Esau, I have made Jacob your master and have declared that all of his brothers will be his servants. I've guaranteed him an abundance of grain and wine. What is left for me to give you, my son? Esau pleaded, 
But do you have only one blessing? Oh, my father, bless me too. Then Esau broke down and wept. Finally, his father Isaac said to him, You will live away from the richness of the earth and away from the dew of the heaven above. You will live by your sword and you will serve your brother. But when you decide to break free, you will shake his yoke from your neck. That was a lot of reading, sorry. <laughs> I want to break this down for you so that you understand, all right? Esau didn't care about his birthright. He didn't take it serious, okay? So he sold it to his brother Jacob. Jacob took it serious, right? Took it serious. When the time came, Jacob decided, based off of what his mother was telling him, that he needed to trick his own father to get that blessing, okay? Now remember, God bestowed his blessing upon Abraham and Isaac. So this blessing is powerful. Jacob understood that. Esau, not so much, okay? Jacob tricked Isaac and got the blessing. If you notice, I'm going to reread um, 39. Finally, his father Isaac said to him, you will live away from the richness of the earth and away from the dew of the heaven above. You will live by your sword and you will serve your brother. But when you decide to break free, you will shake his yoke from your neck. This was Isaac talking to Esau. Now Esau, because of what he did, he didn't get punished, really. He wasn't, you know, killed. He wasn't outcasted. His life just wasn't going to be nearly as good, right? I propose to you today, are you taking your birthright serious? Because God designed you to do something, and if you don't listen or take it serious, someone else is going to come and they're going to get it. All right? It might be your own brother or sister. But I guarantee you that God calls you to do things, and if you disobey God and do what you want to do or don't take it very, very serious, God will align another person that's going to have more fire than you. Now, now, I want to be honest with you because I think this is the best. I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. Last time I preached here, I said, that's a story for another time. Today's the time. All right. I struggled. When I was 16, I started doing drugs. Right now, I, I love when I hear a pastor say they did drugs. That means they maybe smoked weed once. I did opiates. Right, I did pills. All right, I did oxycodones, oxycotton. I did the stuff. Right, I was doing that when I was 16 years old. I started doing it, and it I struggled with it till 21, almost 22. Okay, I really, really struggled. Now, it had complete control over my life. Now, before all this happened. I knew that God had a call on my life, and I ignored it. I ran from it. I pretended that it didn't exist. I knew God was real. The very first time I was ever slain in the spirit, I fought it hard. God got me from a distance. I'll tell you the story. It was funny. Um, I was at a church camp. I think I was 15. I was at a church camp, and I had given my life to the Lord before that, but I was you know, not walking with the Lord. I was doing what I wanted. And I'm at this church camp with Pastor Brent Furlong. Anybody know him? Okay, a couple of you. I'm at this church camp, and they separated the boys and the girls, not because we didn't have equal rights, because they wanted to yell at the boys more than they wanted to yell at the girls. So they separated the boys and girls. And we were in this service, all of us boys, and I was hanging out with a friend who was a bad influence, and everybody I hung out with was a bad influence because I myself was a bad influence. I was a bad kid. And, uh, so I'm, I'm at this event, and the pastor is speaking, and he goes, um, line up, Every, all, all the boys line up, right? And I'm probably seventh or eighth in line, and he's going and he's praying like, in the fire of God, come down. And he's sh putting his hands on their heads, and these kids are falling down. And I'm like, okay. He's pushing them down on the ground. <laughs> That's what I really thought, right? I'm sitting here going, this is, this is not real. I'm like, these kids are just laying down, so the guy will leave him alone because he's crazy. <laughs> That's what I was thinking in my head. And I sat there and said, you know what? This is, um, this is a conversation between me and myself. I didn't know God was listening. I said, when he gets to me, I ain't going down. No. Right? So he's got, remember, he's got his hand on everybody's head, and he's, he's vibrating, gyrating, doing all this stuff, and they're going down to the ground. He gets to me. He goes, do you want to know that God's real? I'm like, yes. He goes, Whoo! So... I, I'm not going to do it because I'll hurt myself. But I was standing at the front facing this way, and I tried to control my fall. It lasted numerous rows of chairs. I took out like 20 chairs. I just, trying to keep my feet. I couldn't. I lost all control. 
and I fell, I fell way in the back, right? Started here and just collapsed back there somewhere. I ran like I was on fire, right? I don't remember much. I just remember crashing into things, just metal clanging and stuff as the chairs were going down. I was wrapped up in chairs, <laughs> crying in the back, right? True story. really did happen, right? And when we came to, when I came to, they were pretty much having service already, and I was in the back like, <sighs> okay. And I just went back up and sat down. In that moment, I knew God was real. But even though I knew God was real, so I'm letting you know that, even though I knew God was real, I still struggled, right? I still got hooked on opiates. I was an alcoholic. I did all this stuff that was crazy. I used to live in a house in Lone Pine, not too far from where Ensley lives now. It's a blue house on the corner right beside the Lone Pine Market. If you ever want to go there and say, yeah, I knew the guy used to live here. You shouldn't, but you could do it if you want. <laughs> at the same time, I've told this story before. Some of you might have heard it. But at the same time, my father and mother had, I think dad had just finished going to Shiloh Bible Institute, right? And mom was still involved in it because she went once a week. I don't know why she did that, but she went once a week. She was there for like 20 years or something like that. I don't know, she's still a long time. But dad, dad just became the pastor of Highland Brethren Church up on the hill. So they drove past my house all the time. <laughs> they would drive by, call me, knock on the door. Hey, you going to church today? I'd have liquor bottles everywhere, people hanging out. I'd be like, ah, oh, maybe not today. I mean, you know, I had a lot of work I did last night. Maybe, maybe later. And every once in a while I would go just because I felt so bad. I, I was happy that my father was doing that, but I felt guilty. I like to tell people... This must have been when my family learned how to pray because God really sort of wrecked my life. Uh, my money, I just never had any. I would try so hard, earn money, wake up, it would just be gone. I could not figure out where it would go. I'm pretty sure God was just like, <laughs> sucker. It would just take that stuff. And every day I would wake up, I'm like, I blew it again. I blew it again. What is going on? Finally, i be honest with you. I, I, like, I like honesty. Honesty, I think, is what is going to teach somebody and help somebody to the next level. I was laying on couch cushions in the middle of my living room trying to stay warm because I couldn't afford my heat anymore because I spent too much money on drugs. Oh, that's what really happened. I'm laying on the floor. And I felt terrible. I was sick because I didn't have any. And I went to the bathroom to use the restroom. And when I walked in front of the mirror, I had the real black, dark circles around my eyes and very bold and very strong in the center of my head. I heard... I created you for much more than this. And I was like, oh. felt pretty guilty. Yeah. Still went to the bathroom, <laughs> still did what I had to do, but it bothered me. It started getting to my heart, it started getting down in my soul. I ended up telling my parents, hey, I need to come home, I just need to get straightened out. And I like to tell the story, uh, I, I'm in the basement of my house, and all I did was read the Bible and punch a punching bag. That's really all I did. <laughs> for a period of time, just dealing with those demons, right? And I fought it, and I battled it. But I had a lot of friends that I graduated with who lost the fight, right? I've lost um, at least 10 friends to overdose or an alcohol-related incident. I've had friends that have drowned on their own vomit um, from passing out and just not being able to roll over. I have friends that uh, their, their mom found them with needles in their arms. Um, because they lost the fight. They lost. I'm not making fun of them. I'm not downplaying that. It very easily could have been me, right? God called you and designed you for a purpose. You can run from it all you want, but that purpose doesn't change. Sometimes I feel like Esau because I feel like I gave away my birthright to somebody else. It's a, it's a battle that I struggle with. I feel that God called me for more, and I blew it early. Now, I'm not sitting here crying and saying I'm not doing anything. I've recognized it now. I've recognized the call, and I'm trying my best. But I feel like, thank you. I feel like I left a lot on the table to start with. I'm telling you this because there's a lot of you that are in this room right now with your butt on those pews, and you're going, I blew it. I'm just trying to get into heaven. That's a terrible way to think. Terrible. God designed you for a purpose, and even if you didn't recognize it at first, it's still there today. Yes, still there right now. Yes, I want to show you how powerful and how much Jacob understood. We're going to read in a different area now. I want to read 1 Kings 18, and we're going to start in verse 25. i got to get to it also. I'm going to lay a little bit of groundwork, just a little bit, so we can advance and no one gets stuck. 
We're talking about a man named Elijah, the same guy that we're like, you know that song? We sing it up here? That guy. All right, that's who we're talking about is Elijah. Now, Elijah was a prophet of the Lord, okay? And at this time in this part of the Bible, uh, he was being hunted by numerous kings. They didn't like him because they were worshiping other gods, okay? They were trying to figure out what, what Elijah's up to. He was one of the only people who was still worshiping the Lord, okay? Are we there? So this is Genesis, oh, sorry. This is 1 Kings 18, starting in verse 25, okay? Here we go. Then Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, You go first, for there are many of you. Choose one of the bulls and prepare it and call on the name of your God, but do not set the fire to the wood. So they prepared one of the bulls and placed it on the altar. Then they called on the name of Baal from morning until noontime, shouting, O Baal, answer us. But there was no reply of any kind. Then they danced, hobbling around the altar that they had made. I like Elijah's funny. This is good. So about noontime, Elijah began mocking them or making fun of them. You're going to have to shout louder, he scoffed, for surely he is a god. Perhaps he's daydreaming or even relieving himself. Or maybe he's away on a trip or is asleep and needs to be wakened. So they shouted even louder and following their normal custom, they cut themselves with knives and swords until the blood gushed out. They raved all afternoon until the time of the evening sacrifice, but still there was no sound, no reply, no response. Then Elijah called to the people, come over here. They, they all crowded around him as he repaired the altar of the Lord that had been torn down. He took 12 stones, one to represent each of the tribes of Israel, and he used the stones to rebuild the altar in the name of the Lord. Then he dug a trench around the altar, large enough to hold about three gallons. He piled wood on the altar, cut the bull into pieces, and laid the pieces on the wood. Then he said, fill four large jars with water and pour the water over the offering and the wood. After they had done this, he said, do the same thing again. And when they were finished, he said, now do it a third time. So they did as he said. And the water ran around the altar and even filled the trench. All right, if you were sleeping to this point, wake up. I need you to hear this next part. Here we go. At the usual time for offering the evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet walked up to the altar and prayed, O oh Lord, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob, prove today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant. Prove that I have done all of this at your command. O oh Lord, answer me. Answer me so these people will know that you, O oh Lord, are God and that you have brought them back to yourself. Immediately, the fire of the Lord flashed down from heaven and burned up the young bull, the wood, the stones, and the dust. It even licked up all the water in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell face down on the ground and cried out, The Lord, he is God. Yes, the Lord is God. Then Elijah commanded, Seize all the prophets of Baal. Don't let a single one escape. So the people seized them all, and Elijah took them down to Kishon Valley, and he killed them there. Ooh. Okay. That's a pretty rough story, right? But when Elijah prayed, he said, The Lord of Abraham, Isaac, and Esau, Jacob. So what Jacob did, was it right or wrong in tricking his father? You ever made a choice in life that was kind of like a little wishy-washy? Was it the right thing to do, wrong thing to do? You ever had just me? I'm the only person that does that kind of stuff? Okay. All right. I'm looking at you guys like, no, never. I always do the right thing. I was, telling a, I was telling a story to the youth group this morning, because we talked about this a little bit this morning. Uh, the story that I told was, have you ever found, have you ever, so I'm asking you, have you ever found money somewhere before? Yeah. What'd you do? Give it back. Immediately. <laughs> Wasn't even tempted. <laughs> John's like, I was tempted. If I would have saw that woman coming down the road, I would have. <laughs> I've found money, believe it or not, three different times, and I've made a different choice each time. You ready? 
Here's the first time. First time I found a $50 bill when I was in high school. We were at a, a girls basketball game down in the lobby. There was a $50 bill laying there, right? So I did one of the, I walked over and put my foot on it. <laughs> and I bent down, picked it up, and put it in my pocket. I was like, I found 50 bucks, yeah. I was like 15, maybe 16 years old. And then a guy came in like this. <sighs> looking around, and I knew it was his 50 bucks, but you know what I did as a good Christian? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. It stayed right in my pocket. It's been 19 years. I can't get it out of my head. I should have given him that money. I feel guilty about it to this day, all right? Okay, that was the first time. Second time I found money. I was the manager at Pac Sun. It was Black Friday. It was wild. People were coming in. They would just, like, throw clothes on the ground and run away. I'm like, are you just hitman? What's going on? They were wild. Right? And I, so I go, and I'm cleaning up my store for like the 18th time already at 6 in the morning. And I'm going along, and I find an envelope. When I, as soon as I touch it, I know there's money in it. So I take the envelope, I walk it up to my cash register, and I put it underneath the cash register. And in my mind, I'm thinking, you know what? If someone comes in here looking for that money, I'm going to give it to them. If they don't come, whoop, whoop, I got some money. That was my thought. Right? <laughs> Sure enough, after the, the chaos calms down, this kid comes in, and he's doing the, the usual, and he's looking around, I'm like, oh, here we go, here we go, and I had a choice. My choice was I could just call it out, or I could wait. I chose to wait, and I just kind of was like, can I help you with anything? He's like, yeah, I lost an envelope with money. I know this is a long shot, but did you happen to find that envelope with money? And I was like, yes, I did, I did. He was like, oh, that's so great. And I was like, I got to find out. I got to make sure it's yours about how much was in there. He said, oh, about 300 bucks. And I counted. He was extremely close. So I give the kid the envelope. I feel great about that, right? I wanted that money. Don't get me wrong. But I gave it back to the kid. Here's the last time, right? This one's, I enjoy this story a lot. I used to have a bank account at uh, Dollar General here in Washington. Pull up to the ATM one day, and there's a 20. What did I say, Dollar General? <laughs> sorry, sorry. Dollar Bank. Every corner you go around, there's a Dollar General, and I just assumed they had a bank. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's a dollar bank. So I pull, I pull up to this dollar bank, and there's a 20 hanging on by one of the corners, just hanging out of the ATM. And I'm like, whoo, piece of candy. So I grab that, I grab that $20 bill, I'm like, yeah. And I get my ATM card. I go, wait a minute. Who just gets $20 out? So I back up in the little ATM area, and I'm looking around. And I find another 20. Yeah. I find another 20. Now, I know the ma at the time, the maximum was 200 you could get out of the uh, ATM. So I'm like, we're looking for 200 bucks. Let's do this. So I'm in the bushes. I'm like, in this. People are beeping their horn at me. I didn't care. I'm going to find that money. I found 180 of it. I'm pretty sure some lady at Bob Evans found a 20. I, whatever. I find 180, and I put it in my pocket, and I'm like, should I go into this bank and turn it in? I'm like, that seems stupid. I'm going to go in that bank, and I'm going to ask them. So I go into that bank. And I know, listen, they've watched me for probably a half hour <laughs> clean out their bushes. They knew something was going on. So I go into the bank, and I'm like, hey, how's it going? The lady was kind of smirking. She's like, can I help you with something? I'm like, hypothetically, <laughs> if you drove up to an ATM where no one was, and you saw no one leave, and there was some money there, and after searching, you put the work in, after searching, you found all the money. Can you keep the money? The lady was like, well, did you see who got the money out? I'm like, no. She's like, did you see anybody out there looking for the money? I'm like, no. She's like, if it was me, I'd keep the money. And I said, me and you think a lot alike. I'll see you later. <laughs> I don't feel bad about that one at all, right? But I didn't want to. There was a part of me that was like, I shouldn't go in there and ask. Right? I don't want to go in there and ask about this. Uh, now I'm telling you the story. I can't remember why I started telling you this story. It'll come to me. <laughs> oh, here's why. That guilt from the very first time that I found money as a, as a teenager, it still haunts me to this day. Now, some of you are like, get over it, dude. It was 50 bucks. But it's the idea that I knew whose it was. I should have gave it to him, and I didn't. And it bothers me, right? And I talked with the kids this morning about, hey, if you're not feeling guilty about stuff, you're in a really dangerous place, yeah. right? Because guilt is one of those things. It's the Holy Spirit working on you to do the right thing right? And if you're ignoring that Holy Spirit, you're very, very far away from God, right? So as you're feeling guilty about, you're in the right place, right? But if you keep feeling guilty, maybe you should work on the things that make you feel guilty. Now, I don't, I regret the decision, but it's not something that bothers me every single day. But I also 
regret the decision of not following the Lord earlier in life. But now that I have done it, I can't go back and change that. Now that I've done it, I am able to say, you know what, God, I've had a lot of experience. You know, I've dealt with being addicted to those kind of things. I can help people that were addicted to those kind of things, and I have. You know, God has used me to talk to somebody through addiction. Because like I said, and I kind of snickered earlier, I've been to places before and pastors like, oh, man, I used to do a lot of drugs. And it's like they smoked a joint once, and now it's legal. Like, I'm not trying to, I'm not saying you should. I'm just simply saying, like, ah. But I really did some dirty stuff, right? I did some dirty stuff at one point in my life. And I understand that mindset. I understand what they're going through. And I've lost friends. I mean, I've gone to... Uh, the very first friend that I lost when he OD'd, I went to that funeral high. You know, that's how, that's how much of a grip it had on me. Now, let's, let's continue on this train of thought. Let's continue on this honesty. I still, still struggle with the idea of wanting to do that stuff to this day. I'm delivered. God has taken it away from me. But the devil still uses it because he knows that it's a weak point of my life. Okay? Understand something. Temptation is not a sin. If you are tempted, you are not sinning. It's what you do after tempted that determines whether or not it's a sin. Okay? When I was struggling with drugs, every time I got paid, I made sure that I cashed it in case I ran into somebody that I knew that had drugs, so I had that money to get some. Right? Nowadays, I don't like cashing my checks. I don't like having them. It's it's not something I need to really work about on anymore. It's just like a thing that I do. I don't like having a pocket full of money because when I have a pocket full of money, it reminds me of the times when I was trying to get high. Okay? When I drive past liquor stores, I try not to look. I used to love Crown Royal. Loved it. It was great. They have so many new flavors. <laughs> Every time I drive by a liquor store, they're like, new sour apple. I'm like, oh, stop it. <laughs> Every time I drive by, you know, you get that little, it always starts with just a little something. Yeah. I wonder what that tastes like. I'm like, oh, devil, get behind me. <laughs> when I hear that kind of stuff. Because I know if I go down that route that it's going to get me. Now, some of you in this room might be sitting here and be like, I drink a beer every once in a while. Does that mean I'm a sinner? Right? This is a great question. I love this question. I love talking to people. The same kind of things. Jesus turned water into wine. Just so you know, the water back then was not really safe. It was a lot safer to drink wine. That's how crazy it was back then. But if you pay attention to a lot of those stories, a lot of those people were drunk, a lot of them, right? And it says that in the Bible that God does not like a drunkard, right? So I'm here, I'm telling him, standing on this stage, if you're a person that drinks wine every once in a while, you're not doing anything wrong. If you're a person that drinks a beer every once in a while, you're not doing anything wrong. If you're a person that needs it, you're barking up the wrong tree. Okay? If you shake when you don't have it, there's an issue. You've got you to be able to be honest with yourself. If you can't be honest with yourself, how are you expected to be honest with anybody around you? I hope I'm getting through to somebody. I just want you, I want you to recognize that God sets things into motion, and it's our job to keep that ball rolling. But God will not fail on your account. He's not going to, right? Somebody else is practicing. Somebody else is reading, right? Somebody else is studying, and somebody else is praying. And God will raise them up to take your path away from you if you don't take it serious. There's many of you in this room today that know somewhere in your heart that you're supposed to be a leader at a church of some kind. You know it, and you're doing this to it. You're just ignoring it. You're putting it over the shoulder. You're just kind of walking by, and you're like, yeah, that's there. But yeah. you're waiting for God to do it for you, right? God doesn't do things for you. God asks you to take one step of faith, and then you would be shocked at how easy it is to keep taking steps once you commit and take the first one. I was at a Winterfest. It was powerful. I was at a Winterfest in 2012. You can still look it up on YouTube to this day and find the moment I'm talking about, all right? 2012, there was a guy up on the stage preaching, and he just stopped and he went, I'm feeling the Holy Spirit in this room, something fierce. I feel that God has called some of you to be fierce leaders, and you're sitting there afraid. It's time for you not to be afraid. Now, right before he said that, I was sitting in the pew. I could not pay attention to what he was saying. 
I was like, my legs were rattling. And this girl was sitting beside me. Her name was Alyssa. She said, what is your deal? I said, I think I'm going to get up and run. She was like, why? I'm like, I don't know. I'm just going to do it. And she's like, they're going to like get you. They're going to arrest you or something. You just run around like a crazy person. I'm like, I don't know. I feel like God's telling me to do it. It don't make sense, but I'm just going to do it. And that guy said, you're sitting in your pew right now, and you're afraid to do something, and it's time to act. And I, I was up. I didn't even just, I don't even, I was halfway down. like, ah! I just ran and yelled. <laughs> and there was like maybe 12 other people that did it too at the same time. We just jumped up like, why? And that place went crazy. Not because of what I did. If I would have sat there in my pew and held onto it real tight, someone else would have jumped up for me. Believe me right? But I didn't. I jumped up there, and it was just wild. The Holy Spirit fell powerfully. There was this big, huge praise break that broke out. If you turn on 2012, you're going to see my brother Lance bouncing <laughs> through this crowd of people. It was awesome, you know? We just went wild. And then after it got done, the pastor, well, not really done, but the pastor said, I'm going to have the people that jumped up pray for you. We didn't even have to, like, go, did you jump up? We knew who we were. We went, we turned our back to the stage, we just started praying, and I was, all I asked God to do, I said, God, I don't know what to say. I'm not smart. I'm going to open my mouth and you just put words in there. Here's what, here we go. First kid come running up like, and I'm like, bah! I don't even know what I said. I just was like, la, 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 la. I just started talking. The kid was like, oh, down on the ground. I'm like, oh. next kid, you know, and I just started going and it got easier and easier and easier because God, I was just stepping out in faith and God just started using me. Now, some of you are more of a reserved person than I. Some of you are like, that sounds terrifying. <laughs> You're telling me you didn't have control of yourself? I'm not telling you that at all. I'm telling you, God was pushing on me to do something. And as soon as I took a step, he took over. Amen. Took over. I didn't have to think. It was like I just drank 20 Red Bulls. I was wild. Right? It's completely wild. Now, does God, can God do that for you in your 50s, your 60s, your 70s, your 80s, your 90s? I'm 100. Yeah, God can still use you just like that. Brayden, you have a really hard time kicking? It's okay. God will use you. <laughs> God can still use you in those moments. Right? I've seen it happen over and over and over again. I'm pushing on you to go to Winterfest. I don't care how old you are. I don't. Please go. If you go there, the reason why Winterfest works so much is because you have a whole bunch of people that are in the same building that are obedient to God, and they listen, and you get peer pressured in doing the right thing. <laughs> Normally in the world, you're peer pressured in the wrong direction, but at Winterfest, if you're not praising and worshiping God, you're a weirdo. And I think it's hilarious because I take these kids that want to go, uh, I have a couple, uh, I'm, I'm going to talk about you for a moment, LJ. You all right with that? <laughs> Do I need someone to speak? Can I, talk, can I talk about LJ for a moment? Okay. If you know LJ, LJ is a quiet, reserved person. Good guy. Good guy, right? He's not the kind that's going to jump on a microphone and, and talk. He's just not. <laughs> LJ went to a winter fest and for the first service. I don't know if he blinked or moved. I kept looking at him, he's looking around, and that's okay, that's all right, all right? The second service, I could see it was really starting to mess with LJ, but I left, I left him alone. I didn't say nothing to him, kept him quiet, right? Third service rolls around, and I see LJ walking, and he was going like this. <sighs> I'm like, he either punched somebody, <laughs> or he's starting to feel that Holy Spirit working, and he doesn't know what it is. So I had a choice. I was like, I could go talk to LJ. I could just let this happen. I let it happen because I like seeing crazy things. So I let it happen. And LJ, you don't have to answer or anything, but I know that God worked powerfully on him that evening. And in that moment, I got this idea. I was like, when people go to Winterfest, they can't avoid it. It's in the air. You can't escape it. You can go to the bathroom a lot, Braden, but it's still going to get you in the bathroom. It'll get you in there, right? So if you're sitting there and you're like, you know what, I'm in my 30s, I'm in my 40s, I'm in my 50s, and I really want to feel a move of God, go to Winterfest. Come with me. Please. <laughs> go to this event. I'm telling you, you can have this every single Sunday morning, and enough of you adults go. Maybe, just maybe, we can finally peer pressure each other in this church to actually having the Holy Spirit move. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't that be awesome? 
Instead of coming to church and looking at TJ and just being like, I wonder when he's going to tell a funny joke now. Or, man, he's acting weird today. Wouldn't it be great if we were just at church and just someone just started speaking in tongues and anointing people from back there or over there or maybe outside on the street that people started walking through the door? Like, what's going on in this place? Wouldn't that be awesome? God's not going to do it for you. He's not. It's up to us, right? When you come on a Sunday morning and you go, you know what? The pastor's going to talk to about noon, which I am. We're going to talk to about noon, then we'll go. Well, that'll give me enough time to get some food, maybe watch the Steelers win, maybe watch them lose. And, uh, you know, whenever you have those like, kind of ideas, I would rather come to church and be like, I'm going to church Sunday, and I'm going to worship God as long as God has called me to worship him. I'm going to be there as long as God has, and I know that he's going to move. I want to see this community changed. I want to see people, I want to see people who are not Christians standing out there confused. I want them to be like, what are they drinking the Kool-Aid in there? What is happening? I'm like, I don't know. You should go in and check it out. Nothing bad will happen. I wanted to come in this room and be affected just from being in the same room as the Holy Spirit. It's possible. All right. There's nothing special about the air in Winterfest. Haley, where's Haley? I'm gonna use you for a moment. Third we have four services at Winterfest. This will be the last thing I talk about. Four services at Winterfest. All right. Haley is a vet. You've gone. How many times have you gone to Winterfest, Haley? She turtled up back there. Seven, maybe seven times. Seem about right. Six, five, four, three. A bunch. She's been there a lot. Haley started doing this thing. It was like two years ago. On the th like before the third service even began, she started crying. And I'm like, Haley, what's up? And she's like, I'm gonna have to go home. I said, hey, like, we haven't even gone to the third service yet. So there's two more services. But there's only two more services. I want to stay here. And I'm like, okay. Now listen, what Haley was latching on to was the move of the Holy Spirit, yeah. not the building. I had to talk to Haley about that just to make sure that she knew that. I was like, Haley, you realize that when we leave, like, there's no more church services in this building. Like, they might play baseball or something. Like, it's not. It's not going to be. And she was just like, I know, but I just want to be in Winterfest all the time. You can be. You can be. You can be. You really can be. All you have to do is start taking the first steps. On Sunday morning, praise and worship's going on. You want to stand up, you want to shout, but you hold it back. Why? There's probably five other people that want to do it also, but because you're holding back, they won't start. Is it going to take for all of us to fail? before new people come in and push you out the door so that this church, this place, will actually become anointed? I, I, come on, don't be Esau. He sounds like a great-looking guy, and he's a great hunter, but he blew it. He blew it. All right, I'm going to stop talking because I'm going to get crazy. What I'm going to do, what I'm going to do now, if I could get, uh, you want I was going to have to pray for people, but if you're sick, I don't, yeah, come on, it'll be fun. <laughs> Can I get Pastor John to come up? Pastor Tim. Okay. All right. I'm going to do an altar call. And what this altar call is, it's going to be different. I don't want you to come up here and cry. God help me with money. God do that. That's all important. I want you to come up front. If you know that God has called you to do more than what you're doing and that you've been running from it, that's what this call is for today. If you've been running from your call, I want you to come up front. We're not here to make fun of anybody. Honestly, we, we've all ran a little bit from a call. But if you know in your heart of hearts that you're supposed to be doing more, please come forward.